Welcome, we're joined by Fred Tatlian, aka Goliath the Great, one of the Armenians who's taken a very active role on social media. Fred, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. So to start off, Civilnet is in the midst of doing a series of interviews with Armenians from around the world to find out how the war affected them and what they're doing now to help Armenia get back on its feet. So to start off, can you uh, tell us a bit about yourself, your Armenian roots, where you're from and where you're currently living? I, I'm a descendant of, uh, our, our, you know, my grandparents were, were orphaned uh, because of the genocide. And um, they, they, you know, from uh, they were in Turkey around the time, well, modern day Turkey um, at the time. And, um, you know, they're orphaned and they made their way to France where they started a, a family there. Um, and that's where my, my aunts and uncles were born. But then they repatriated back to USSR Armenia during the repatriation movement that was happening. Um, I, I forget the dates, but I believe it was in the 40s or the 50s where there was a, a mass uh, repatriation happening. Um, they made their way back to USSR, Armenia, and that's where my father was born. Um, and, and I was ultimately, obviously, born in Yerotmas. Um, and when I was three years old, we moved to uh, America, and I've been in Los Angeles ever since. And so now I call Los Angeles home. And so you've taken a very active role on social media, uh, spreading a lot of information on what happened in Karabakh and about Armenia in general. How do you see uh, social, me social media's uh, role in the third, uh, second Karabakh war and in general now uh, in terms of modern warfare? And I also want to ask about the cyber war, which is important too. Uh, many Armenian channels and individuals were hacked by Azerbaijani hackers. Uh, how do you perceive all of this? Yeah, it, 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 it all happened like a whirlwind. I, I don't think any of us were quite ready uh, with, with the cyber aspect of the war. Uh, when, when, the first, uh, when we first got the news of, of a war happening, um, uh, I was pretty active already in the Armenian community in the social media aspect, uh, not in the news type of or activism way, but mostly just uh, being active in the community, making memes, jokes, things like that, just having fun with the Armenian community. So when this happened, um, all of a sudden, you know, I started making memes regarding the issue, but then I realized that there was a massive attack by Azeris on me. Um, and so it seemed very unnatural, not like I've never seen anything like that before. And so that got me some very serious and, and uh, made me really think quickly on what was happening. And it became uh, fairly uh, apparent to me at the time that there was a massive um, force of Azeri bots. I realized quickly that there were bots. There's a lot of bots happening with the, with the aim of attacking anyone and anything, whether it's celebrities or Armenians saying anything uh, positive about Armenia. Um, on top of that, they were uh, hacking accounts. And so part of the things I was doing on top of spreading information uh, to our community, I was also helping um, educate, educate our people on, on how to properly secure their, their social media channels and things like that, you know, using app authenticators and, 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 and double uh, uh, factor authentications and things like that, just so they won't get hacked. But there was a lot of uh, accounts that were hacked in the beginning. Um, but as we became wiser, uh, we were able to prevent that. And really, um, the, the social media aspect, they're, they're, it served multiple purposes. Number one, there's an information war happening, and it's still happening right now. And it's, and it's happening uh, uh, through social media in that any time uh, there is a, uh, let's say, a news release about the event, there's a mass effort by bots or, or even armies now, cyber armies, uh, to go and either support or to take down these kind of articles, or even to go into websites and rewrite history. As you know, there's a mass effort by Azerbaijan to, to instill this whole Caucasian Albanian narrative, uh, trying to rewrite over our history in the area. And a lot of these narratives are happening online on certain websites. And so uh, we're very active on finding these, uh, th these areas that, that's happening, making them public and, and, and fighting against it. Um, so information is, is one of the key aspects of it. Uh, on top of that, it, social media has been a great tool for the diaspora in helping us mobilize uh, where it was for any time we need to do activism here in, in, you know, or in the diaspora in general, not just the U.S., but all over, all over the world. The diaspora was very active, uh, you know, doing protests and, and uh, general activism. And it was through social media where we were able to share information, uh, unite, mobilize act quickly, act swiftly. 
And another key aspect uh, that social media played is fundraising. Uh, fundraising is is and continues to be a huge aspect uh, or tool that's used by social media. Um, with with all the tools by f- uh, Facebook and Instagram, we're able to raise a lot of money that that we can send uh, back home uh, fairly easily. And and for our viewers who may not know, can you explain what are bots and what are bot armies? Right. So bots are essentially their their accounts, their social media accounts that aren't con- necessarily controlled by humans. Uh, they create these fake accounts, and so what what will happen is. Um, let's just imagine for a second, there's this, like, let's say a word doc that's filled with 10,000 comments, pro Azeri comments. Okay. So it has like 10,000 comments and what these bots will do once they are deployed by one user, I can, I can say, Hey, there's this article that's pro Armenian and I want the comment section to be filled with pro Azeri comments. So anyone that goes and reads this article that's pro Armenian, they'll go to the comment section and and realize that these Armenians, they're liars, you know, and, and uh, it's fake and their history is fake and all this stuff, whatever their narrative is that they're trying to push. So they deploy these bots by the thousands. And what these bots do, they're automated. There's no humans behind it. They go to these uh, to these comment sections and they literally grab one of those comments from that long Word document I told you, and they just drop it in there. And then they go and they like each other's comments as well to, to drive it up to 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 make these comments at the top and it took us a while to realize um a while meaning a couple of weeks for us to realize what was happening and so we began to mobilize on our end not with bots but with you know obviously real uh people real armenians and we were we were finding these areas where were under attack to then try and fight back and and um and prevent the narrative uh, for, you know to, to being shifted to what they wanted which at the time was armenian aggression that's, that's the whole thing they, tr- they kept trying to push is that Armenia is being the aggressor in the situation. And so that was their narrative. We're constantly battling. And I'm also... Trying to win, basically, no, please. Uh, uh, basically trying to win over the support of um, non-Armenians. Essentially, that's what's going on, right? Anytime you want policy change here on the local ground, you need the people on your side. You need the, the politicians on your side. You need the news on your side. Uh, because if they're on your side, then then there's real policy change that begins to happen uh, that then affects you know international uh, relations, and so that that's why this is kind of important because it all policy change starts to happen with public opinion, and so if we can you know they they were trying very hard to sway public opinion into believing that somehow Armenia was the aggressor in 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 the war crimes that were committed against us. Mm. And and some believe that state forces may have been involved in these bot campaigns, whether it was Azerbaijan and Turkey. I'm curious if you believe this was possible. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's proof of it. Um, there's proof of it. Around around the time when it happened, um, there were uh, studies done and uh, investigations done by much smarter people than I uh, that understand how to look at um, internet traffic coming out of certain countries. And I released all of this uh, at the time, and I can find it if I really, really, really need to find it. Um, but uh, essentially what it showed was this. It showed, number one, that traffic was killed in Azerbaijan, meaning uh, the people were not allowed to use the internet. Uh, or social media, I should say. So it's very obvious that none of these comments were coming from the people. Um, another way, uh, uh, you know, an easier way to, to, to see that is you can block comments to your page from certain countries. And when you're doing that and you're still getting the, the bots hitting you, you realize that the bots are not being originated from there. It's being originated outside of Azerbaijan. Um, I, pers- I have a personal belief, it's, it's just a theory on my end, um, that a lot of the campaigns weren't even launched by uh, Azeri um, operatives in the sense that I believe the state was hiring non-Azeris to do these attacks. And I think it became clear, there was one instance where there was a, a funeral happening of a soldier. There was an Armenian soldier and they're burying him and his, co- and his coffin was covered in an Artak flag and the family was crying over this coffin. And they released uh, uh, like a like a uh, uh, like a press release, right? Uh, basically, a PR campaign saying like, "Oh God, look at poor Azeris! You know they're burying their dead. It's obviously an Armenian being buried with an Armenian flag." At first, this was funny to us, and we made a joke and memes out of it, like, "Oh look, these Azeris! You know they're they're so dumb, this that." But 
I was like, wait, they can't, you know, I mean, yeah, jokes are funny, but they know what an off-top flag is. You know, whoever did this was not Azeri. They they had no clue what was on that coffin. And that's why they didn't. And to me, that was one of like a, a little piece of evidence that showed me that uh, they're, they're hiring agencies that weren't even Azeri to, to do a lot of these campaigns. And um, also I'm interested as a US American, I'm interested what you think about the Biden, administ uh, Biden administration. Uh, obviously, during the campaign, the Biden-Harris campaign released a position paper pledging to recognize the Armenian genocide, um, as well as many other uh, provisions. And the future Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, has recently pledged to increase US aid to Armenia, review security assistance to Azerbaijan, engage with the OSC Minsk Group, um, uh, so do you think Biden is good news for Armenia or do you think this is just more empty promises from the Democratic Party? You know, you, usually I, I would always say any, any kind of uh, politician that comes out with pro-Armenia talk is just all talk. But I think in this instance, I think there's a little bit more to it in that uh, the Biden administration didn't need to pander to us at the stage at which they're pandering to us meaning they, they won the election, they're in office, you know, why, why pander to us? What, what, what would be the benefit? Unless there was actually something behind it. So for me, I, I think that there, there is something there. I, I really do believe that. Um, and, and simply because they really have no reason to appeal to us at this stage. What do they have to gain by appealing to us? And so I, I think, uh, you know, he, uh, the Biden administration appointed some Armenians to, to key positions. Which, which, you know, is fantastic. Um, you know, there's been a lot of tough talk happening uh, in, in regards to Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, there's been aid to Armenia. So uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing and hearing so far. Uh, do, I, what, do I get my hopes up? I mean, we've been disappointed so many times by U.S. politicians. I'm not getting my hopes up too high, but I, I think there is something there, though. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this, how this develops. And how do you see the situation currently in Armenia and Artsakh uh, from California? And also, I want to know, what is your message to diasporan Armenians, many of whom feel because of this distance, they cannot really effectively help the situation? Uh, what would your message be to these people? Well, first, uh, what I see happening right now, um, I, I see a lot of from here, it looks like, and I guess you, you're trying to you're trying to get an understanding. I mean, you guys in Armenia know what's happening, and so I'm assuming you're trying to get a feel of what it is that we see. Uh, and I, I think for what I think we see from the diaspora is um, a lot of um, um, uh, disunity. Uh, it, it looks like the, the unity is gone. Uh, the unity that was there uh, during the war. It seems like there's a lot of infighting happening uh, to me to us. Um, I don't know how true that is. Again, I, I understand there's a lot of misinformation that's out there and, and part of the battle of being on social media is being able to try and sift through it all and, and make sense of it and know what's real, what's not real. And, and it's increasingly difficult um, because it, we, we live in, in an information war age where it, it's all about manipulation. So it's very difficult. But to us right now, it seems like... Um, the, People are going at it with each other. That that there's, uh, you know, the the two major factions that seem to be um, in constant disagreement. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, we would like for you know for for that to to be remedied somehow. And I think the remedy isn't you know everyone just hugging and saying kumbaya and everything's going to be all right, but rather understanding that we're all Armenians and you and I might have diff different political beliefs, but at the end of the day, we want what's best for each other, number one, and we want what's best for Armenia. And I think we need to remember that sometimes, that, you know, it's okay to argue, it's okay to even get heated arguments, but I think a lot of it has, from what I've seen in my comment sections, um, from what I see uh, even here in the diaspora, is, is that sometimes it gets really, like, ugly, the conversations get really ugly if they aren't moderated properly um, or reminded that, hey, we're family here. We're all family. And at the end of the day, I don't want anything bad to happen to you and you wouldn't want anything bad to happen to me. And I think 
I would say that we need to be reminded of that and that we're family here and we're already we're already you know we're already like a small little population we're speck on this world and the world is against us the the, the last thing we need is to be against each other and so uh, we we need that unity back and the unity meaning you know combining our efforts for common goal rather than just using our efforts to try and tear each other down um and and that is kind of disheartening to the diaspora but we realize it, it it's there's a lot of hurt feelings and uh, over time, hopefully it will, think, you know, time heals all. So hopefully um, sooner than later. Well, Fred, thank and you. And my message, oh, your, your last question was my message to, to who? To diaspora and Armenians that want to, uh, because I, I feel there has really been this uh, um, explosion of activity coming from the diaspora of many diasporans wanting to get involved, do different things. So I wanted to know what would your message be to the uh, many Armenians around the world who feel they're very far away and want to get involved but uh, can't really find or um, yeah. locate exactly how they can do that. Right, uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think the diaspora has been activated and there's a, there's a, a, a huge population of us that want to do things, that are ready to do things. And I think there's even a, a larger uh, population of us that that are kind of timid because they they don't know what to make of the situation that's happening. They don't know who to trust, what to trust, and so they're kind of off on the sidelines and waiting uh, to see what happens. You know, there's those that are very active right now that are saying, regardless, we need to help. And and then there's those are there are those Armenians that are that kind of pulled out and are just saying, let's let's just wait and see what happens. And my message would be uh, not to wait and see. We we don't have that luxury. Um, we have to be active, we have to remain active, we have to continue to be active. And there's many ways we can be active. Uh, number one is we, we have to keep money flowing into Armenia. Um, just like Israel does, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, Israeli, every Jew out there in the world is sending money back to Israel some way or another. We need to have that same kind of mentality. That money needs to flow into Armenia because that's what's going to prop the economy. That's what's going to help uh, create programs, infrastructure. That's what's going to help us rebuild Armenia. And sure, there's, there's, and, and so some of the, some of the fears of the diaspora are corruption. Uh, and, and it is the system. And I think, I think the message is, you know, we need to stop looking for a savior. It's not going to be one person that saves us when the system is broken. And uh, I think part of the diaspora's efforts need to be in helping fix that system. And I think the reason it's important that diaspora gets involved in that is because we are involved in systems that can be good examples. And we, we work in these systems, meaning the political systems, the, 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 the infrastructures that we, that we have in the diaspora, we can teach and bring back to Armenia. And so we have this wealth of knowledge. We have this understanding of, of how these things can be implemented. Local governments can be fixed. The major government can be fixed, how things should look and operate. And I think uh, each one of us with our different expertise um, can, can help uh, you, you know, bring, bring that expertise back to Armenia and, and help rebuild and, and fix the system. Because once that, fixed, once that system is fixed and, and people, the diaspora believes that it's fixed, I, I think we're going to see a, another resurgence of the di diaspora effort, a huge resurgence. Right now, you know, like I said, the morale has been, ha has been hurt. Uh, morale is, is is low and we're slowly building it back up but i think once we start seeing unity happening in armenia once we start seeing um, uh, the system be getting fixed becoming more transparent better with communication which is just a typical armenian problem i think you know horrible communication um, i think once those uh, areas get fixed a little bit uh, we'll even have more diaspora support over time in due time well, Fred, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on Civil Net.